analytics came in the game to, and their slogan was 10 years ago, they may not admit it now, but their slogan was, we're going to put players in the best position to be successful. We're going to give them information and we're going to allow them to be um, really utilize their skill set. And, and we're going to keep them healthy. Well, you've never heard anybody talk about that since. Five ball, onto the track, at the wall, it's gone! Home run! Turns on a ball, deep right field, and gone! What a game, what a moment. All right, I am joined again today by the Hall of Famer John Smoltz. John, thanks for uh, thanks for hopping on this week. We got we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, it's been a uh, newsworthy week. Yes, and one of those one of those topics is one that you and I have really dove in on over the past year or so about this topic, and it seems like this past week it has really come to the forefront of the baseball world, and it is arm injuries and there have been a slew of arm injuries around the league very recently in terms of Spencer Strider, Shane Bieber, Framber Valdez, but you know, even longer than that, then you get into the Gary Coles, Jacob deGroms. I mean, it seems like time after time, people are going down right now. We've, we've had the talk, but you know, I'd, I'd love to dive in and on it again. What, what do you think is the reason behind this is it one particular thing you can point to is it a culmination of things if you had to pinpoint one thing what would you say it is yeah i've been talking about this for 10 years when it first started and the um kind of the introduction of high velocity spin rate and analytics right analytics came in the game to and their slogan was 10 years ago they may not admit it now but their slogan was, we're going to put players in the best position to be successful. We're going to give them information and we're going to allow them to be um, really utilize their skill set. And and we're going to keep them healthy. Well, you've never heard anybody talk about that since. You haven't heard anybody talk about why the root cause. Everybody comes up with these nonsense excuses that mean nothing. And they get people to look the other way when the root cause has been going on for 10 years. You cannot. You will not be able to stay healthy uh, if you throw the ball as hard as they're throwing it and spin it as, as much as they are. Now, I do not blame the player whatsoever. This is the reward reward system they are in. I've been banging this drum for so long, and now yeah, people have. are now people are looking at it like it just happened, and that the pitch clock is the reason. That's nonsense. Anybody who has never put a ball in their hand that talks about something they don't know about is nonsense. Now I will trust a pitcher who has thrown a million pitches and he tells me something's wrong with the baseball four years ago. I'll trust that because he's got the ball in his hand. If they can't get a real good grip and I'll trust that. And so there is really the, the root cause has always been there. You cannot throw a ball at a hundred miles an hour and sustain that for five to seven to 10 years. Yeah. And people just, they don't want to talk about it because they realize that what they started 10 years ago hasn't been successful in the area of keeping guys healthy. But if I'm a player today, I'm, my hands are tied. i got to get drafted. i got to get looked at. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to these entities that promote and, and have definitely cracked the code on throwing the ball hard. We've mastered throwing the ball hard and spinning it really, really tight. <laughs> yeah. But we've not even come close to being able to be honest to say that these arm injuries are not linked to that. And listen, my era and the era before me, we were paid to play. We trained to longevity for marathons. We've talked about this at nausea. And now all of a sudden, a few people come out and say the pitch clock is, is the reason guys are yeah. getting hurt. That's why I can't be quiet anymore. And that's why I'm passionate about all these players have no choice. What are they supposed to do? If the reward system is X and you don't get punished for not pitching, then – then I'm going to keep trying to do the same thing and ask for different yeah. results to happen. So that's when you get, I don't have hair, but the little hair that I have, what? you don't, up, I don't believe it or not. <laughs> and when people want to throw that out there and just see if it sticks and then people write about it without any data to back it up. That's, that's my been my biggest passion since I've been out of the game is I talked about it in my hall of fame. I talk about it everywhere with youth sports. No one's listening because the reward system and management has not made a necessary adjustment to address it. 
And so if they're not going to make the necessary uh, uh, assessment to address it, this will continue for the rest of time before we know it. We're going to run out of every great arm that has ever thrown a baseball. So I I talked about this the other day as well and said that I I thought the pitch clock conversation was more of a short-sighted conversation that that needed to be had. It it feels like that's just right in front of us. But so do you think, do you think that has anything to do with the last couple of years? I know the route and and I we're very much so on the same page with, with, you know, like the the arms just not meant to throw the shit out of the ball every single time and spin it as hard as you can every time. That's the root of it. Do do you think the pitch clock has maybe accelerated it to any degree or do you think that's a non-factor? I think it's in, in the scope of things, it's a 10%, maybe 20% factor. And, and some people just have not adapted, but here's the deal. Let's let every pitcher throw it as hard as they can and take as long as they can to throw it. And let's just see, first of all, the games will be five hours. Second of all, we'll just see if they stay healthy. My bet will be zero chance. So the reason the pitch clock came into play is guys were taking so long to execute. The game was suffocating and it was losing attendance and fans. So when the pitch clock comes in and the data shows Guys weren't even getting to 18 seconds. The reason they shaved two seconds is data showed it wasn't even a factor. Yeah. And, and when three to five pitchers get out in front of it, they're telling you something that's about to happen that has no relevancy and data behind it. So listen, I get it. I know they're in a tough spot, but it's a, it's a small spoke to the wheel. The root cause has been forever for the last eight years this has been a trend working in the wrong direction and now all of a sudden something comes along we want to we want to we put that on it no i'm sorry doesn't hold water well john then this is the hardest question i'm going to ask you because we've talked about this ad nauseum and and we both agree but what what is the answer i mean you the pitchers are incentivized i you know when yeah when i was in the minors from 2013 to 17 all you would hear from an organization is I, w- this guy needs to be throwing 95 plus. We're not drafting guys unless they can touch 95. We want them to throw it as hard as you can. Look at these analytics. You spun it a little bit faster doing this. And that's how they get up to the big leagues and have temporary success and then get paid. So yep. we, what do what do we do is the frustrating thing because they're incentivized to do it, but then they're getting hurt doing it. I mean- Well, inevitably, there will be a time where there's a rule change that affects philosophy on this, meaning the game has changed because rule changes have caused clubs to either decide to change the way they play or not. And that's really what's going to end up happening because nothing is really shown that it's going to self-correct. This is all on management. I'm sorry. It's all on management and what they want out of their players. And so if they think that there's enough arms that they can suffer the injury rate that's happening, they're going to keep doing it. But in my opinion, down the road, if there's a rule change that inc- that incurs the team to look at it and go, hey, we might have a competitive advantage if we ask our starters to go a little bit longer. So let's look at a different training mechanism. But here's the deal. If everything in life, you're addicted to the outcome that has been what you've norm- known forever. If you're addicted to strikeouts and 1.9 ERA and 2.1 and you only get to pitch when you're healthy, then that's what's going to happen. Yeah. We have to get used to a higher ERA, more innings, if that's the way they want the trend to change to keep guys in the game. We know for a fact doctors have made this absolutely a non-negotiable. You cannot throw the ball this hard for this long and be successful. Yeah. And these guys train to learn to throw it harder. Now they might have to train to learn to be in seventh gear, yeah. eighth gear. So that's that's the point. It all falls on the reward system. You're 100% right. I, I just – I don't know the statistics behind it, but I can tell you around the time I was – high school to college age is when it really became popular. Now, just so everyone knows, throwing a ball overhand is not a natural arm movement. And what I do know is around that age is when I saw people start picking up weighted balls bigger than a baseball, throwing them backwards, throwing them as hard as they can into a wall. And my mind, without any statistics behind knowing the, the science behind it or any of that, knew this can't be good for for your arm in the future it just can't be and and we've seen i feel like yep. it's all tied into each other there's no doubt and look again if if i were to just somehow be a young john smoltz trying to make it in the game today 
I would not be able to be stubborn to be able to throw at 94 and 93 where I was comfortable. I would be forced to throw 98, 99, which therefore, based on my body composition, I mean, I'm based, I'm, I'm like Gumby anyways, things fall apart. <laughs> I would not have a very long career. And here's the part I don't understand. Without naming entities and without calling people out, why is everybody so eager to crush the person who speaks truth? Right. We're in this world where there's going to be people who are going to attack this conversation and say, well, John Smoltz is still living in the 1980s. No, I want the guys that are talented to be able to have as long a career as they possibly want. And that is just not happening today. Well, a little bit of a, a change of pace, but still talking pitchers. I mean, I, I named some of the guys that have gone down so far. Strider, Shane Bieber, Framber Valdez, Garrett Cole going to miss a big chunk of the year. So when you look around the league now with many of those superstars that maybe had a chance to win a Cy Young, who who are some names that jump out to you that now you think, wow, this guy now really has a chance and could turn it up this year and end up winning his first Cy Young award or maybe maybe multiple? Yeah, I think obviously the guys that stay healthy are going to have the big time advantage. Yeah. And the one guy that I come to, to to look at that he has not really had a year where he's thrown a lot of innings, but he's super talented is, is Glass now for the Dodgers. I think he's going to be a fan. I think it's just Cy Young uh, opportunity is through the roof. That offense, his ability to stay healthy, Zach Gallen, you know, guys who know how yeah. to pitch who don't necessarily have to rely. I love Zach Wheeler. I know he's gotten off to a slow start wins wise, but he's pitching great. Wheeler's always going to be in the conversation. You're going to have your surprise, but look, we, we, we can't keep thinking 150, 160 innings is going to be good enough to win the Cy Young. Yeah. And in American league, you've got a slew of guys in Seattle. They're off their their staff. Any one of those guys, now that they don't have any handcuffs on them, they could emerge as a Cy Young favorite. And then of course, you know, when you look at some of the people that are banged up, it, it really is a wide open race that it's going to be the healthiest guy at the end is going to win the Cy Young. It's interesting you say those guys out in Seattle don't have handcuffs on them because I just had Bryce Miller on the show who was talking about in spring training. He was on a, a splitter pitch count, basically. It's a brand new pitch for him. They told him not to throw it as often as he wanted to in spring to work on it. And now he said the other day he threw it like 20 times in a game and they've really kind of taken back that pitch count. And he's just throwing that splitter as much as he wants, not as much as he wants, but a, a lot more. And they have kind of pulled the, the reins back. That rotation is nasty out there. Oh, if they get any offense at all. Um, we keep talking about the Seattle Mariners. Uh, they are dangerous if they score. Yeah, and he looked good with the uh, the glass now pick there because he just punched out 14 guys the other night. So he's, he's looking good. He's nasty. Another guy looking good in uh, Houston has been a guy that nobody even knew if he was going to make the team. Ronel Blanco um, makes the team, find out, finds out he makes it after being in the hospital all day, having another kid, goes to the field, makes the team, and then throws a no-hitter in his first start, his eighth ever big league start, takes a no-hitter late into the game in his second start. Uh, just a remarkable start to the year for Ronel Blanco. So I'm not going to ask you if Ronel Blanco is going to win the Cy Young Award, but what I am going to ask you, John, is I need a I, I need some close no hitter stories out of you. I know you're one of the greatest of all time. You don't have one. Uh, neither did that rotation you were a part of. Smoltz, Glavin, Maddox. Nobody got a yeah. no hitter. So um, talk to me about some of the some of the closest you ever got to him. Yeah, I had a couple. We talked about one where I ate a Zagnut in the ninth inning uh, in Philadelphia, and that with one out, it, it blew my uh, no hitter. I hadn't eaten all day, and I was I was about to pass out, and and it was a day game, and I shook off Greg Olson on a two zero pitch. I didn't think that Lenny Dykstra was going to be, you know, I, I made a mistake. So that was the first one that I had. How many outs were there get. when you shook him off? And one out, one out, uh, and and it was one of those games where if I got Lenny Dykstra, obviously, you know. I, I'm going to get a no hitter, but that allowed me to never eat a Zagnut the rest of my life. I blamed it on the <laughs> Zagnut, but the no hitter that I got, and I'm, and for me, I've got a no hitter. It's just not in the record books. It was in San Diego. I believe it was in 96 when I was having a really, really good year. It was one of, one of those games where you're just in a zone. I had 12 strikeouts, I think going into the eighth inning, it was uh, two outs and Tony Gwynn was up. And, you know, I couldn't get Tony Gwynn out. And in my mind, I'm going, if I get Tony Gwynn out, I got a no-hitter. Yeah. He hit a fly ball to left field. Ryan Klesko was playing outfield for us at the time, a first baseman. He was a, he had to run about 20, 30 feet, and he, and he got to the track, and the ball hit his glove and dropped. And 
I just knew it was an error. And you know, it was Tony Gwynn and it was in San Diego. Yeah. And the crowd went crazy and they gave him a double. And so therefore I uh, couldn't convince Bobby to let me pitch the ninth. Cause I said, Bobby, if I get three outs in the ninth, they have to change it. <laughs> and he looked at me, he said, not with that man, Tony Gwynn, <laughs> they are not changing it for him. So though there were a couple others I got into the seventh inning, but the reality is the three of us never did get one. Uh, I was the guy that was supposed to get one. And in my mind in San Diego, I got one. Honestly, if you, if you pitch against the Padres and give up one hit and the one hit is Tony Gwynn and then it's an even, and then it's a questionable one that should, it should just count. I, I totally agree. And every time I saw Tony Gwynn at a card show, he'd have that little laugh and that high pitched voice. And he's like, <laughs> he knew, he knew it wasn't a hit, but he also knew he was the greatest hitter of our generation. And he could have said, come on, John, really? They're going to give me an error. And uh, it was fun to, to banter with him. If you were, it, why, why hadn't you eaten that whole day? The day of the Zagnut bar, was that a superstition heading into the game? Like what led up to you needing to start a major league baseball game and not eat all day long? So I was trying to figure out, I was like my second year in the big leagues and I was asking every starting pitcher, what is their routine? What's their, when, when do they eat? Like, I didn't know when to eat. I didn't know when to, I was trying to figure out my system. And, and, and one of the veterans, I think it was Charlie Lee brand. He said, I try to time it so that when the game starts, I'm bordering an empty stomach. He said, I like to pitch on an empty stomach. So I took that as, okay, I got to time this to have an empty stomach. It's a one o'clock game. I can't eat because <laughs> if I eat, I'd have to get up so early to eat. So I tried it and it failed miserably. I was so hungry and so <laughs> gassed. And we did not have the, the, the beautiful food that, and the, the healthy food back then. So we just had junk food. And the first thing that stood out was this red Zagnut. And I and I crushed it real quick to give me some little burst of energy. And I blame the Zagnut. I've never had one. I'm not going to eat one. As you shouldn't. John, always a pleasure, my friend. This is a fun conversation. Uh, you know, not always fun stuff. The the there is an arm, there is an arm problem in Major League Baseball these days that I and you are are passionate about uh, uh figuring out. But uh, a fun conversation as always, my friend. My pleasure. Look forward to next week. All right, until then. See ya.